to the BSG Podcast, the podcast where pop culture and nerd culture meet at the nexus of the universe and are melded as seamlessly as the 4th of July and eating too much stuff. I am one of your hosts, Brenton Beswick, alongside my co-host, Uncle Sam's nephew, favorite nephew, some would say, Gregory Filson. How are you tonight, Greg? I'm all right. I got a haircut today, so I'm looking sure clean, did. no length in the back, uh, you know, I'm feeling okay. Uh, it's a little dreary out today, a little cloudy, but it was nice. Went to the farmer's market, walked around, saw my boss. That was fun because he's like, oh, my God, you had a haircut. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing all right. It's a, it's a good week. I'm, I'm ready to hop into this. How are you doing, Brenton? It is hotter than the seventh circle of hell in uh, western Pennsylvania. It was, ni- it was 91 degrees it's, today. It's hot everywhere except in Santa Barbara. That's what's it funny. It was so... It was so oppressively hot. I stepped out outside to let the dogs out at, at like eight o'clock in the morning and was like, nope, not not interested in this <laughs> at all. So super hot the last couple of days. Supposed to well thunderstorm tonight. It's supposed to keep raining, so hopefully that cools things down. But otherwise, um, no real complaints. Nothing nothing really super exciting to uh to report that was just one quick story um okay. before we get in um so you know you're a friend of mine of course we do this together and then i have my right. friends at work here in santa barbara but i was like i don't have any outside of work friends that's it right. that's all i got you know here and i was like i told james like i would like some out of work friends so i can hang out with people can't we won't talk about work because there's nothing to relatable right so I'm helping this girl that I've helped before, and I, I was like, oh, like, recommend her this book that, you know, I'll mention in the comments. I've mentioned it before, but just, like, I finished it and everything, and I go on and on about it. And then I meet her husband, and I'm just like, I'm in that moment where, like, I just want to, like, say, like, can we be friends? But I don't do it. I don't do it. And I regret it. I regret it right in the moment. And I'm just like, you know, when you're a little kid, you just walk up to people, and you're just like, let's be friends. Right. You know? And it's like, it's weird when you become like an adult and you're like, and more like past college or whatever, you're like, you know, and I'm, you know, 36 or whatever, but like, you still want friends around or whatever. And it's one of those weird things where it's like, it seems embarrassing now, but when you're like eight, you're just like, hey, we're friends now. So that's where I'm at. And now I'm going to like, you know, I maybe, I maybe like Facebook stalk these people to figure out their things. I, I, you know, one of those things. It's just like, it'd be nice to have friends to hang out with that aren't work people. And that's my story. It's right. just, that's a, that would be interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, we're friends. We're friends, but not, we can't, there's a, we can't go country and, between us. Yeah. We can't, yeah. We can't go out and have a couple beers, hang out right. together just like today after this. I, I know, I'm not going to say names because I don't want to put anybody in any type of position, but I know one mutual friend of ours used a friend finder app to find friends. And now those people are like best friends. So maybe like you need that. to get on that. Yeah. No, I'm just gonna. Hold, I'm holding out for this. Crazy. Yeah, I'm just holding out for these two. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I don't. Yeah. If it's not them, then whatever. Yeah. No, I hear you. <laughs> like the whole. Well, it's like I've said. You know, my my closest friend is is Bob Sacramento, right. and he lives an hour and a half away from me. Right. I mean, you know, and as far as like my other like friends that I consider very close, you know, you live obviously in California. One of my other good friends lives in DC. Um, fun. Here's a fun thing though. is another person who I consider a good friend of mine because we used to work together and has been a guest on this show. Dallas DJ outro himself got hired to the place that I'm working at. Oh, nice. So now we're going to carpool together. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So I'm sure insanity will. Ensue. Yeah. That can only uh, be, that can only be great. Is, uh, or something. Yeah. Um, uh, housekeeping. Uh, BXG podcast publishes every Friday at uh, 12 p.m. on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Amazon Music, Google, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, podcast services worldwide, as well as YouTube, where many of you psychos choose to listen to the actual podcast app. Uh, official BXG social media accounts on Facebook.com slash BXG podcast, Instagram at BXG podcast, at GT Phil's at Y2B, Twitter at BXG podcast, and, and then obviously, like I said, the YouTube thing. We are still 
doing the giveaway. We've got um, uh, we've got plenty of spots open <laughs> uh, for the next twenty five people who share a BXG post and tag uh, either BXG Greg or myself will be entered into a drawing for $25 gift card of, of your choosing as long as it's not something seedy. I was informed that my seedy example was Skip's video, which is, was a really janky strip club in yes. Mercer. Uh, I was infer- informed by JJ Kish that that is no one that has been shut down years ago. That's too bad. So RIP Skips. Uh, corrections, corrections and clarifications for this week. Um, the game with the poop monster with corn teeth is Conquered Bad for a Day. For the uh, Nintendo 64, wow. which I am, of course, of course, um, representing nice. tonight. Nice. Uh, the N64 shirt. Uh, the Brett Favre cover debacle when he retired and then came back for the Jets was mad in 2009. Wow. Uh, Avatar 2 releases December 16th of this year, 2021. Finally, this is a clarification on the Doggo rant. Uh, in episode 39, Greg averaged 2.4 doggos per minute or DPM in the doggo like rant. An official, an official stat. Yeah. It's like war. But yeah, I prefer I prefer VORP. VORP, yeah. Yeah, value of a replacement rather than war. Uh, we'll keep track of that, though. Know. That's going to be a stat you're going to keep track of throughout the season, right. you know? For your fantasy. Yep. Right. Uh, guaranteed you'll be leading the league in if you have a if you have a bxg fantasy account time. if you're scoring at home That'd or be... even if you're alone right. <laughs> there's probably something there uh final correction uh, ragnarok the netflix series that i have been watching uh takes place in norway not not sweden as i initially initially reported we have a great six packs of topics for you tonight we have a food review for the fourth of july uh, which is going to be very tasty, but uh, as well as some some quick hitters, one of which I'm I'm particularly upset with. <laughs> All right, we begin tonight <clears throat> on our six pack with number one Loki episode for the Nexus event. On Lamentus One, Sylvie tells Loki she has escaped. She escaped from being kidnapped by the TVA as a child. Uh, Loki and Sylvie form a strange romantic bond, creating a unique branch timeline that draws the attention of the TVA and allows for them to be rescued from Lamentus uh, before it is destroyed. They're both arrested and Mobius leaves Loki in a time loop from his past with Lady Sif, where she repeatedly assaults him for cutting her hair. Mobius later interrogates Loki, who tells him that they are all variants who were taken from previous lives. Although he originally does not believe him, Mobius steals Ravenna Renslayer's time pad and confirms that Ravenna pruned C20, Hunter C20, for revealing she knows she was taken from a previous life. <clears throat> in response to having the time pad stolen, Ravenna has Mobius pruned himself. Meanwhile, Hunter B-15 has Sylvie show her her past truth, learning she is also a uh, stolen from a previous life. Ravenna has Loki and Sylvie presented to the timekeepers, but B-15 helps free them. And the pair take down Ravenna and the rest of the Minutemen. They cut one of the timekeepers' heads off, revealing they are robots in a very Wizard of Oz type scheme. Loki is about to explain why he believes the Nexus event occurred on Lamentus, but Ravenna regains her senses and prunes Loki, resetting his existence. Sylvia takes Sylvie takes down Ravenna and demands answers. In a mid-credits scene, we see Loki recently pruned arrived in an unknown location and asked if he is dead. He is told not yet by four other Lokis, including a lizard Loki. What uh, what did what did you think about this episode? Uh, I thought this was the best episode so far i really liked it i liked all the week like i like how they were making fun of him for like hey this is like the female version of you you're such a narcissist that yeah you you and i thought that was funny yeah i thought that was funny um i thought the fact that like all like we still have two more episodes after this so we still have like a decent amount of storyline to go and yet we got so much we got the timekeepers as like robots and they don't even really exist and now we're kind of at this thing where like we don't even know who's at the helm, who's controlling this. People kind of know, you know, everybody's kind of at this thing where nobody knows what the hell's going on now because it's all exploded. And we still up when we have two episodes, presumably around, you know, probably like an hour and a half. So, you know, not a Marvel length movie, but a movie, you know, a small length movie left of information and stuff to happen. And I just, I just thought this was like, you know, had, had a good amount of, you know, action with the, you know, hand to hand combat. But then there was like the, 
you know, the, the whatever romance thing you want to take that as there's still the, you know, it was nice to have Owen Wilson and Tom Middleton back together, Middleton back together, uh, doing their thing for a little bit, not thrown in your face. So I thought beginning to end and then have the Loki thing at the end, including the lizard Loki, which was just cracked me up. Uh, I thought that was just beginning to end like best episode with like the most at stake. You know, we talked about that with Bad Batch, you know, in prior episodes. And we'll talk about that tonight, too, going forward. It's like, I like it when there's more, feels like there's more at stake. And this episode seems to be like, there's a ton at stake now. Loki's been, you know, sent off to this other world. It makes you wonder if we'll catch other people that have been sent off in this other world now. If that's what happens when you get pruned. Um, Yeah, it feels like there's a lot to happen. And I also feel like we don't know anything now. I think a lot, I think a lot of us thought we kind of had an idea and now we have no idea. So I, I like that. Um, what, do you, what do you think? I didn't really care for this episode. Really? Um, I thought it was boring uh, for most oh, of wow. the episode. I just thought, I, I'm starting to think between Falcon and the Winter Soldier and now, to a certain extent, Loki, that just series aren't a good idea for Marvel. With established characters, I think that it's a good idea maybe moving forward with some of these new characters like Miss Marvel, She-Hulk, Moon Knight, whatever. It gets us an opportunity to get acclimated to them in a different way. But yeah, I was bored uh, through a lot of this episode. Uh, You know, there was like the the whole thing where they prune uh, Mobius was like so uh, like shocking and out of nowhere, but at the same time, they spent no time dealing with it afterwards, like dealing with the fallout. Uh, I think that there was, you know, they were looking for shock value with he just suddenly disappears. But then to not even really talk about it the rest of, you know, the rest of the episode after, you know, Loki has this moment with him where he's like, would you take the word of a friend? Because now they're like friends and there's this, they have this moment and then he's gone and then there's no payoff for it. I also didn't like the inclusion of the mid credit scene at all because i think it just completely removes all tension going into next week with where is loki is he dead is he gone is this now her story i just felt it was unnecessary it would have made more sense to me to leave it as a cliffhanger and that be the opening to the next episode rather than do the the end credit scene i think my thing on that is we know he isn't dead in this part of the marvel universe in the in the timeline we actually know he isn't so i don't think there is any like oh, is he dead? I don't, you know, we knew he wasn't because, right. you know, I, I think that's kind of where it is. Like I, if, if this was, let's say before end game, you know, or whatever, when he, you know, is actually, you know, killed by Thanos, maybe there's like that kind of thing. But since we know he comes back and is in end game or whatever, um, in, or in uh, infinity war, I'm sorry. Uh, that's the thing where I'm like, I think they just kind of did that as like, you you know he's not dead here is where we're at and we have this lizard loki and you know the three other lokis I, i'm surprised you say you were like bored through it. like i was like totally captivated a lot of times i mean not a lot of times but with any of these shows i like can definitely like feel like i can have my phone up and going through it like maybe the first 10 minutes this one i was like on my phone but i was definitely interested in the storyline I, I think mostly because now that everyone kind of understands that they were not born into this i find that interesting to me and maybe that's just where I'm at, like a storyline. And maybe I just wanted more of a storyline going forward with this. Cause it didn't really feel like there was anything for a while. Well, that was the and thing now with that was, it was like, okay, that was the sticking point, but you know, he Mobius learns that he, or he kind of figures it out. And then Hunter B 15 <laughs> takes Sylvie back to the like weird Walmart thing from the, the, yeah. the one episode, second episode, I think. And show me she's like show me that i but then you don't see it so there's no like you don't hit any of the emotional beats of it's not like we get to see hunter b15 and her name's actually beth and she's got two kids you know what i mean so there's no there's no emotional hit behind that it's just oh well that i guess that sucks for her you know what i mean but there isn't any that like i think that was the thing was they they built up to this by telling us that and like we talked about last week it was almost a throwaway line it happened so quick and then we knew coming into this episode that we were going to get that addressed and then it just really wasn't 
in certain ways. We found out that that was true, but we don't necessarily know what the ramifications of that are. And that's what I was kind of looking for. And I don't know that we're going to get that because next next week's episode is going to clearly be dealing with, you know, Sylvie's going to be interrogating, uh, what's her name, Ravenna Renslayer. And then Loki's going to be trying to figure out how to get off, you know, Loki land, as I'm going to call it. I, I just, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Do you think it's Loki land or do you think it's, I mean, because that's the thing we, this is the first time we see someone, you know, get, uh, you know. Ding, frozen, <laughs> ding, frozen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the oven preheating uh, for dinner. Uh, so, I gotta, yeah, but um, this is the first time we see someone get, you know, I always say taves because it's funnier for me than pruned. But it's the first time we see someone get pruned and actually see what happens. Like, right. you know, you're not actually killed is what it looks like. I mean. Are you yeah. taken to a land of your of your alternate selves, or is it all one land? So I think that's still interesting. And, and you know, we still have two episodes left. Like I said, we still have like a short movie, a regular yeah, like sure. comedy length movie left to, to make things work out. So I'm still very much intrigued. I still like the show. I you know, it has two episodes, so I, I, we won't grade any of these shows until, or I won't grade this until it's done, of course. Right. But yeah. I'm still really enjoying it. And I do. I will say that it just. It is funny because when I first heard about this show, I was like, you know, I like Loki fine. But I knew a lot of people love Loki and were like so in on it. And they're definitely the more I talk to them, they're still super in on it. But like, I like him more now than I did in the actual movies too. Like, I really like, I like Tom Hiddleston just as an actor, I think is more, not necessarily as Loki, but I just like the way he is like presented in this and his facial expressions are really good. Um, if you pay attention to that, I just think he, is kind of in this weird thing where he's like Tom Hiddleston, this like trained British actor as Loki in these things. And this is what, what he, you know, has decided to do. And he's very good at acting. You might not see it all the time, but if you just watch him, the little things, which is what I was trying to do with those last two episodes with him, he's good. He's like his reactions and stuff to things that happen around him are pretty funny. So if you're, if you're listening and you just check that out, he has so many good facial reactions. So it is. Um, and I wonder you know, I I have a feeling we're going to get uh, Mobius back too. I think we will. I would hope so. Uh, I, I'll be real pissed if they don't explore that at all. You know, what I feel I mean? like they like, have. He's, to. Just, oh, he's just gone now. The end. I feel like, him. yeah. I mean, you know? it's a really famous person playing a character that you know they had to know people were going to like. Yeah, I can't imagine so, they brought him in for three episodes because he wasn't right. in the third one at all. Right, you know, maybe like a minute. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like that's going to be addressed. And, you know, and that rapport is just, you know, whether you think it's too much or whatever, it is still a rapport between yeah, two no, characters. No, 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 no. So the, their on screen dynamic was the only thing, in my opinion, that saved this episode from being a total disaster for me. I, I did like the thing where he just had where Loki had to keep going through the same scene over and over. Yeah. And he's just like, ah, oh, crap. Like, and he's like, oh, do you really think you'll <laughs> always be yeah. alone? And yeah, so I thought that was good. Yeah, overall, I mean, I just, like I said, I, I'm I'm starting to wonder, like, maybe these shows aren't a great idea. I don't know. I mean, I still like, I I still like having Marvel content. I will say yeah. 100% that. I'd rather it's gonna have. It's going to feel a lot would you rather... in about a week, though, when we get yeah. an, an actual Marvel movie. Yeah, right. And I don't deserve it there. And we're going to have a week, and then we're going to go five more weeks, and we'll get another one. And then, you know, we're, we're going to start getting Marvel movies back in our lives. Yeah. And I'm stoked about it. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know. I, I just feel like maybe whereas and a lot of it could a lot of it may have to do with who's in charge of each of these shows. On one hand, it's easy to compare the Marvel shows to the Mandalorian because they're both Disney properties. But on the other hand, it's it's not necessarily apples to apples. Mm-hmm. But whereas. I just, it's hard for me when you have an eight, an eight show uh, run for Mandalorian and you have a six show, six episode run for Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Loki. And to me so far, both of those shows have had pacing problems. And then you have a longer show or more episode season in Mandalorian and it does not have pacing problems. I, and I think a lot of that has to do with who's doing the. I was going to say, I think that's just a little different on like who's actually doing the. Yeah. But we can't have John Favreau yeah. do everything. Right. He right. is only one man. Is he? Nerd Jesus. <laughs> Hashtag. <laughs> Hashtag nerd Jesus. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, 
there's still two episodes and i just felt like it started off really strong the first two episodes were really good i thought yeah and then the third episode was eh, okay it's not bad and then this this episode just didn't do it for me at all but that's just me that's one man's opinion sure so all right so we're moving on to topic number two and it's uh we're going to continue with summer of george uh having our friend john kish on a uh, big friend big friend of the program here huge friend of the program he uh, got the west video for me um but we're talking about the absence it's the 143rd episode of the american sitcom seinfeld <laughs> it's the american sitcom seinfeld this is the ninth episode for the eighth season it was originally broadcast on the nbc November 21st, 1996. Uh, this episode focuses on George and Elaine's experience with sexual absence, which has polar opposite effect on each one's intelligence. Meanwhile, Kramer's face becomes disfigured by smoke when he turns his apartment into a smoky lounge, prompting him to file a lawsuit against the Paco companies. This show, Dollar to Donuts, has maybe the best like characters that come into play. I mean, you have Jackie Childs, played by Phil Morris, uh, Derek Jeter and Bernie Williams as the Yankees right after they won the World Series, but only in six games, uh, as well as Bo- Bob Erdek- Odenkirk as Elaine's um, not-doctor boyfriend, Ben. And Dave Letterman makes a, a great appearance at the end. So I love this episode, and going back and rewatching it was so much fun. But, uh, uh, John, why'd you, uh, why'd you pick this? Why, why was this your Summer of George pick? What's well, kind of funny because like Brendan texted me or called me about it and I said, you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of a sign of a fan, but I didn't really watch it when it started. And I actually thought this was the episode you guys were talking about the week before the, uh, the contest. The yeah, the I contest. Thought it, thought it was the same episode. And then I was, and then I was like, it's not. And, and then like, I looked at the date of the episode, which is one day before my birthday. And I didn't watch Seinfeld in high school because I was in junior high and everybody said I was Newman because <laughs> I was fat. And I was like, I'm not watching someone that says I'm fat. I'm not like, oh, I'm no. like Newman guys. So I wasn't even interested <laughs> And then, like, my wife watches it, like, religiously. So then I got into it because of that. Oh, nice. And then this is the episode that I remembered, even though I thought it was the last episode until I watched it. <laughs> I think, I actually think people have that uh, correlation with this, because if you bring it up, it feels like it is that episode. But for me, what, what stands out, there's, I think there's two really key things to me that stand out about this. You know, uh, beside the, like, main storyline is... Jerry's side storyline is so funny to me how he's getting booted from like certain things and his manager who ends up being Kitty in that 70s show so another like key character going forward like his storyline's there but he's the main character show and it's just completely kind of pushed aside and they try to make it something but the other three characters this is the thing about Seinfeld is you can have the other three characters shine so much and there's so many lines from this it's just you know George showing Bernie Williams and Derek Jeter how to like hit homers it was just hilarious to me. Uh, but yeah, the, the show had so much in one, it's 22 minutes and there's so much going on. So I think it's, I think it's one of those episodes that a lot of people don't talk about. And then you rewatch it and you're like, oh, this is maybe a top 10, 15 episode of all time. I agree. I, I love it. And like, I'm a big Always Sunny fan and I could just see like the characters doing yeah. that, like an Always Sunny, a little raunchier, but like this, like Always Sunny stole Seinfeld and just made it like, you know, as hard as they could it was like it's the same characters it's always the same way like every character does their yeah. own thing like there's no like jerry's the main guy but really it's not. turned up to 11 is the, the way i've always looked at it, it always sunny at seinfeld turned up to 11 it's it, you can get his way with as much as you can on you know fx or whatever Brenton, what was your what was your takeaway from going back on your rewatch of this i i, I feel like i've said this for almost every single episode but i remember these episodes for the side stories and for me this one is is typified of the kramer story for me of the, <laughs> the, the cigar lounge and then he, he rolls into jerry's apartment and jerry says your face looks like an old catcher's bit and it was you know four days worth of of inhaling you know c- cigarette and cigar smoke in his apartment and that's the thing that i always remember about this particular episode i wouldn't like if you said you know, the absence, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. It sounds like it should be the contest. But if you said the episode where Kramer sues the tobacco company and winds up as the Marlboro man uh, on the big, on the big thing in, in Times Square, that's what I always remember about this episode. Uh, As funny as, you know, George basically becoming a genius and then, um, you know, Jerry getting bumped for like the lizard man from the zoo at the, at the junior high career day or whatever. Um, 
that's the Kramer thing is the thing that I always remember about <laughs> this specific episode. Look away, I'm hideous. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna make a and I'm Jerry make a trying not to break in that scene. Jerry yes. trying not to break in that scene is one of my favorite trying not to breaks because he's gone. If you've ever watched like the outtakes of it, it's so hard for Jerry to get through it. And this was the best take, and Jerry's smiling at the end of the take because it's insane. I mean, Kramer goes so off the rails on that and the fact that he makes the deal another get jackie child's getting screwed just being like the marlboro man smoking yes. so good yeah and I, I was there is there a favorite moment for you john in this episode that really just like sticks out like brent said it's kramer but is there just a moment or a line it just like every time it, you see it you're just like oh this is why i come back i just kind of love the end like where george rushes late to the town show He's like, well, I'm not going on, but I had to tell you about the waitress. Like, I should have come tell you about it. Like, it's great. It's uh-huh. like, we all have that friend. It's it's, like, that's him. And what's funny, too, is when George is like, you know, uh, gains all his intelligence and everything from, from live and sex. It's just, he um, he orders with the Portuguese waitress. He's like, do I te- detect a Portuguese accent? And then he orders a big salad for Elaine, which is just so funny that they do this little thing and it's kind of almost like passive too, where like he does that and you don't think about it. And then he's just like, Oh, you had sex with your girlfriend. He's like, no, it was with the Portuguese waitress. I did the mathematics and uh, mathematically I had to do it. It's so, it's so good. (laughs) So I know in preparing for this episode or talking to you about it, uh, one of the things that stuck out to you was, was Bob, Bob Odenkirk. Oh yeah. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, why you like, I mean, obviously, Bob Odenkirk's hilarious. I mean, most well-known for Saul Goodman, Attack of the Show. But what was it about Bob Odenkirk in this particular Seinfeld episode that that stuck out to you? I, it's just crazy to, to see him now. And, like, I kind of went down a Bob Odenkirk YouTube rabbit hole after this. And I watched him on that, I think it was Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon, where, like, he had the uh, birthday party for the Breaking Bad for Brian Cranston. And they were wearing the same outfit. It was just hilarious. I just love Bob Odenkirk in general. Like, he kind of steals all the scenes he's in. Yeah, he's, he's great. great with um David Cross on uh on Attack of the Show. That's right, that's him, right? Attack of the Show, yeah, 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 Mr. Yeah, Mr. Show, yeah, Mr. Show. show. Dave, yeah. Right? yeah, 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 old school HBO. Yeah. I think it's funny too that we have two of like our favorite characters, you know, in Breaking Bad make their appearances like really well known appearances on Seinfeld, so yeah. it's it tells you the pipeline. And we we're talking about this today, like the celebrity, the people that like. We're celebrities in a moment where it's like Bette Midler. You know, I think that's to me my favorite like celebrity that is the celebrity on the show. And then people that end up being like famous and they had their kind of like coming out moment on Seinfeld. And Bob Odenkirk is as high up there as anyone, really. I mean, Brian Cranston, Bob Odenkirk, it's it's pretty funny. Yeah, I thought this, I thought this was a great episode because of the storylines. Like we all pick different things. And yeah. you know, there's only four characters, and the three of us pick completely, you know, all three different storylines. So um, yeah, John, I can't can't thank you enough for for picking that, and for also the West video. I get to actually thank you in person. That was incredible. <laughs> I actually rewatched it the other day. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for coming. I was so excited. <laughs> like I, I was so excited to do that video. Like I was so pumped up because I want. Like I've been playing around with cameo for yeah. like a minute, and I was like, I want to do a cameo. I just want to do the some stimulus money. Thanks, whoever gave me the stimulus. Whoever president, <laughs> I don't care. I want to get one. And I was looking at um the Chris Hansen, you know, the guy that yeah. does Catch a Predator. I wanted to do one of those, but then I was like, let's do something with, with uh, Fessy. Was Fessy yes. would have been, uh, would have been like, yeah. Fessy's but yes. I mean, you know, I, I don't think he like, knows how to re- hit record on his phone or anything. So it, that would be the problem. <laughs> and Wes yeah. handled it so well. Like I, I mean, I only wrote him like three lines and he so did the good. rest. Like it was fan- yeah. Like, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that was... It was a real, it was obviously, I was like losing my mind during it. So I can't, I personally can't thank you enough. Was it was so much fun. And thanks for coming on. Thanks for picking such a great episode that we could really like dig, you know, dig pretty deep on. Yeah, it was cool. Did you guys read the Wikipedia on the pay on the- uh, I glanced at it, yeah. Yeah, the I glanced guy, at it too. The guy that plays Jackie Phil Chow, Morris. Name yeah. Phil Morris, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah, that he had said he, he enjoyed- being in an episode where they took on the tobacco company since he had been named after well not named after but shared a name with one of the you know major tobacco companies but yeah yeah, yeah. 
took crap yeah. for everybody. Else. I can't. I I feel like I can't imagine that really being a thing. I mean, if he says it is, because I don't feel like you know, as like a ten year old, you're going to get ripped on for your name being Philip Morris because it's who sells cigarettes. You know what I mean? It's not like being told that you look like Newman. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> there you go. Damn, damn Matt, Matt Postage, man, and uh, Ryan Knight just ruined Seinfeld for like four years oh, for me. There are a couple of bastards then for it. <laughs> they really are, you know, but whatever. Yeah. I, mean, I watch it now, yeah. so it's all good. I don't know. Well, hey, we appreciate like Like Greg said, we appreciate you giving us a great episode and coming on tonight. Thanks, John. No problem. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. All right. We move on to number three, uh, Bad Batch, uh, episode nine, Bounty Lost. Uh, we learned that the reason Omega is so sought after by Camino Prime Minister Lamassu is that she has the same genetic code as Boba Fett, the original Django clone. Lamassu has arranged a meetup and instructed Nalase to re- retrieve the genetic code and then terminate Omega. Bounty hunter Cad Bane takes Omega to the rendezvous point with the cloners, but on the way, Omega tricks Toto 360. Uh, Bane's uh, droid and escapes briefly. He recaptures her and is about to exchange her when he sees the dead body of the cloner and standing over her is Fennec Shan. Bane and Shan uh, battle as Omega escapes from Toto and eventually signals the Batch who is able to rescue her. Bane fails to get his bounty and Fennec relays to Nala say that Omega has escaped the bounty hunter. Uh, What did you think about this episode? It felt like the middle of of a movie episode which is where we're at with this show you know like we're kind of in that i get like not the it, let's say it's a third everything's broken up this is the the second third of this whatever and we're like there's something that happens she's taken away and now we have to find her and she escapes a little bit and so we get you know oh she's escaped and then she's taken back and then we re, you know we find out the information about boba fett and now she's back, and there's a little line at the end, like, you know, you'll never go back, I promise, and all this stuff. Yeah, and it's right. like, but we still have some episodes left, and they're still going to try to hunt her down. So it's just that, it's that right before we actually hit the climax, like, the next two episodes will probably be, like, where things actually get crazy. And, you know, for as crazy as a show can get for being a, a cartoon. Yeah, so I think it was, you know, it was cool to learn the Boba Fett thing. Um because every time Boba Fett is mentioned in any Star Wars lore, everybody gets excited. Beyond that, it was it was a fine episode. I, I never got too excited about anything other than what I just said. So, you know, I, I'm like, I still, because it's such a long season compared to where other seasons, you know, shows are at and in, the, in this world, there's still a lot actually left. So I'm still excited to see where this goes. I mean, it's still that same thing where like, oh, they encounter a problem hijinks ensue they sort of solve it or something bad happens as like a to be continued this time it was something good happens but it's still a to be continued for my part i really enjoyed this episode uh i thought the action sequences between cat bane who's awesome yeah cat bane is awesome when, when he comes onto the screen and the uh the music changes to the sort of like sergio leone yes. spaghetti yes. western type situation that they have going on is, is great his just the way he carries himself is is really uh really fun i thought the the action sequences between him and fennec Sheehan were were really well done and like you said quote unquote for a cartoon but i feel like that it's things like that that kind of make you at least momentarily forget that you are watching a cartoon and i would also say that to the people who are like i'm not going to watch this because it's just a cartoon dumb decision yeah because cartoons can be i mean we did our episode on our our 10 favorite animated movies uh, you know a while back cartoons can be or animated things can be just as powerful as as thinking with real people so if you're not giving this a chance and then that's that's bad on you aside from the action sequences between the two of them i mean this was there wasn't a whole lot of you know clone force 99 i do think that they are going to go back to camino i think yeah. that that's a almost a guarantee yeah uh, at, at this point, as we have, what, 10, 11, 12, 13, five episodes left. There's no way around it, really. I'm interested to see, you know, long term how the show winds up, because I do think that we'll get a better indication on whether this is a one season thing or it's going to be a multiple season thing. 
there was still there's still a couple threads out there there was the episode where we very clearly got a look at or or we assume that we very clearly got a look at ahsoka just some other like threads out there that that could be pulled on here in these next episodes yeah. so i'm curious and and very interested to see uh to see where it went uh just as a complete aside to this was the first time Fennec showed up in the show, I was like, I don't really feel like the ages line up. I remember saying that. So I did a little bit of research. Mm -hmm. So in the Bad Batch, they assume that Fennec is 27 years old. And I'm like, well, that would make her 57 in The Mandalorian. Right. <laughs> and then I looked up, I looked up how old the actress who plays Fennec Shand is, Ming-Na Ming Wen. She's 57 years old, which doesn't seem right to me Whoa. because she's very attractive. <laughs> well, I'm yeah. older ladies, you know, I'm not saying older ladies can't be good looking. You know, they also old. age differently in, in in the Star Wars universe. So I guess, you know, maybe yeah, that's I it. was shocked. I was shocked when I learned that that she was almost she's almost 60. That that like blew my mind a little bit. Nice. I mean, I know this is just going on with your like thing about um the action scenes i always think that all the action scenes in this in this series are actually like you kind of forget you're watching an animated feature because when you watch action scenes in a star wars movie between two people that aren't humans i guess you know what i mean like or are in, yeah, sure. in gear they look pretty much the same because it's still yeah, like sure. cgi or whatever so they do a really really good job of making these scenes like look really cool and you kind of suspend your belief of it being animated. So that's like one thing. The action yeah. scenes are always kind of killer. I kind of always forget. I actually always feel like I forget to mention it because they are just so good. I don't even think about it. I'm just like, these just look great every single time in this show. Right. So, yeah, we'll see kind of where things progress with this as far as, you know, pulling on some of those threads that we mentioned as we kind of wind down here to the last several episodes but kind of in tandem with the bad batch this week is last week you got to spend the day at disneyland i did in in la and one of the main things that you did was check out uh the galaxy's edge yeah. which is the big star wars thing there so do you want to tell us a, a little bit about it yeah it was so much fun um we kind of wandered into it by accident we were actually going into like the different part of disneyland and i i'll be honest i kind of forgot about it just because it's been two years and then you know since they opened it and then COVID hit and all this stuff you're just like looking for regular disneyland i'm like holy crap we're in galaxy's edge so like and then you go in there and you're walking around they make it look like you're in a star wars movie i mean you really do feel like you are in just you know whatever whatever planet anybody goes to they kind of make it like a they make it more or less like a be all planet you know any town any town star wars kind of thing um <laughs> but you're walking around and we see the first ride there the big ride that everybody talks about uh rise of the resistance and it's like oh you got to make you got to make a reservation so we immediately have Janie get on her app make the reservation um it's like well six hours from now check back um to, to get in wow. there but it's you know it's, it's disneyland and so that was noon whenever we were able to actually like sign up for that so you, i mean you can easily waste six hours in disneyland so we do the millennium falcon um smugglers run which if you are familiar with disneyland i don't know how what disney world has but there's something called star tours where, like, you're on yeah. this... Okay, mm -hmm. so you're on the ride, and it, like, takes you through all these different things, but the smuggler... It's like a virtual... Yeah, but the yeah, smuggler's run is. is you actually control the ship. So you have four oh, people. Wow. Um, one steers, you know, left to right. One steers up and down. Somebody uh, is the gunner, and somebody is the, like, mechanic, essentially. And I was the up and down. Janie was left. It's super, like, it's fun. It's it, But you're, like, yeah. real deal... It'd be it, like honestly, it's one of those things where you kind of want to go there on like a crappy day where you could just do that like multiple times and see oh, how good yeah. you, you know how good you could get at it. Like the first time we did, you know, I thought we did fine. I it did not grade us fine, but that that was a lot of fun. <laughs> and then you go out there and there's like the part where Kilo Ren and a couple stormtroopers come out there, and because of COVID, they can't have people come up there. But like Kilo Ren, yeah. pull, pull, you know, he points out a little kid and. So it's like talking to him and doing the Kilo Ren thing, which is super cool. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. Kilo? Kylo. Kylo. I say Kylo. Kilo. I'm sorry. I, Kylo Ren. What? I know. Is this a metric system? It's a metric system. I'm sorry. Okay. It's how I measure my Proceed. run. Kylo Ren. Sorry. Um, Kylo Ren comes out and he's talking so to the kid. you measure your dark side? Yeah. 
and he's talking and do, he's doing something. It's a lot of fun too. And right by that is the uh, blue milk, green milk stand. I know you're down the green milk, but you have to try them both. I mean, they are still part of the Star, yeah. Star Wars world. The blue sure. milk is kind of like blue raspberry. The green one's kind of okay. like Thai tea. It's the the green. Why wouldn't it just be mint? It should be mint. Too, it should be mint. Too obvious. Probably too obvious. Um, that would have been better. It, both could have been better. It's one of those things. I'm glad I'll do it. I'll never have them again. Right. Unless, like, yeah, I right. take a child and they're like, I have to have it. And then I'm like, I'm going to have to drink some of this because the child's not going to be able to handle all that sugar. Um, so then, you know, they have all the ships around. That was really cool. Um, there's actually the cabana, but you, like, can't go to it. You have to have, like, a reservation, like, immediately in the morning to go. So we didn't even get to see is that. that. Is it the Moist Isley Cantina? It's the, uh, uh, why, why did I had it and then it. Is it. Is it the one from which movie is it from? Uh, it's from. I'm just gonna look it up. It'll be easier if I just do it because Ogas, yeah. Ogas Cantina, Cantina. So, um, it, it looked cool from like the pictures I saw of it online. I mean, it looks like a Star Wars Cantina. Um, super, you know, just janky, you know, crazy looking inside. But we didn't get to see it. You couldn't see anything. You can build your own lightsaber, which looks super cool. I actually held Luke Skywalker's lightsaber thing, and that was that was a lot of fun. But then, you know, we do the rest of Disneyland, which is awesome, and we like had no waits in line because everybody was doing Star Wars stuff. Essentially, we come yeah, back sure. and we get this message that I know it's a really long story, but it really sets it up. No, um, no, no, no. we get back, and you know, it's six o'clock, and it the Rise of Resistance is down, and we're like, oh crap! Oh no! And the park closes at nine. This was six o'clock. And I was like, well, let's go, you know, ride another ride, maybe grab a quick, like, small bite or something like that and see what happens. And 7.30 comes around, and they're like, oh, the ride's back open. So we book our way over there. You know, we're thinking, you know, are we going to get in? The park closes at 9. The guy's like, well, you guys are fine. You were part of the first, you know, that reservation. The line is so long because it was all the people had reservations at that our time and then the time that was after. Then, yeah. So I think we waited in line for 55 minutes, maybe an hour. We get in there and the first part of it is okay. You're in like this little ship. It's it moves around a little bit and then the show starts. You go from this ship, you get you get taken in by an imperial ship. You open the doors open up. It's stormtroopers everywhere. So this sounds like a virtual thing also. It's it, this if it, it's virtual and then it becomes your part of a storyline. Okay. So you the doors open up and you're actually walking out and there's animatronic stormtroopers out there mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of like imperial, you know, personnel taking you to the next spot like what are you guys trying to do kind of thing and they're talking to you and they're like getting into you. And you see all the stormtroopers. I got chills. I get goosebumps when that door opened. You see all the stormtroopers. It looks so cool. You really feel like you're just in it. You actually kind of... There is this moment where you're in this disbelief of like, holy crap, am I actually like going to have to do something? So then you go to the next thing to get you boarded on these ships to like... As part of the Imperial sh uh, Star ships, like more or less to like kind of ship you out into space and see what happens to you. And they have you line up. And the characters are, like, super into it. This little girl was leaning up against the wall, and one of the Imperial uh, uh, cops was basically like, I suggest you don't lean up against the wall. And the little girl starts laughing. She goes, do you think I'm funny? Do you think this is funny? And it's so, they're so in character. And then you get on this ship. And, of course, right when you get on the ship, you know, you're kind of sitting there, and then the wall busts through, and it's the Resistance saying, hey, we're here to save you. You know, blah, blah, right. blah. And you're doing that, and that's when the ride really starts. So it's a real, like, shifty ride, you know, moving all around, back and forth. And there's a, there's a rise that takes you up. And when that happened, Janie's dad said an expletive in front of, expl expletive in front of kids that was hilarious because he does <laughs> not like things like that. And it takes you around, and then you're right in front of um, Kylo Ren. And this is the second part I got chills because he uses the Force and moves your ships you know no, not really but it's just yeah. so perfectly right. in tune that you're just like yeah. oh this is cool this is star yeah. wars and then they take you out and they're like we're gonna try to get you off and then get you off the ship and then there's this nice drop 
nice drop that scared everybody except for me because I love things like that. I was the only one going like, woo! Everybody else was like, ah! Uh, yeah. But no, it's like, as you know, there's a difference between an amusement park like Cedar Point and in a theme park. As a theme park yes. ride, this is an A+. plus ride yeah. because you are 100% like in it you feel like you're part of it you really do I mean like you know and for any like person that is that that you know the kid in you the the Star Wars fan in you and you want that to you want to be a part of something like this and they really do bring you into it um this is I can't imagine the ride actually being better because you even get a little thrill with the jump up and the jump down that sure. you didn't need to make it good but just added enough to it so yeah, the whole experience is really cool. Uh, I can't wait to go back. Next time we'll go back, we'll go to California Adventure, so I can go to Avengers Land and just... Yeah, Avengers <laughs> Campus. Yeah, yeah I go to Avengers Campus and just hang out. But yeah, no, uh, it's super cool. If um, if you can go to it, I highly recommend it. If you can just do... I mean, you can do... We spent... If you combine... I, don't, I won't say the wait times, but the ride times and everything. I mean, we were there for two and a half hours of our day there just hanging out mm-hmm. so if you're a star yeah, wars fan yeah. you're gonna love it i mean you could spend more time there it's just the way it, you know the way things go but totally right. it's a great excuse me great attraction so they have uh galaxy's edge at disney world in um orlando as well at hollywood studios and we're planning on disney world this this year nice end of the year so hopefully we get to <clears throat> experience that that's a you hit the nail right on the head. There's a difference between a theme park and a amusement park. Cedar Point, the world's greatest roller coaster park. We've been there, you know, yeah. together. Like you said, like you said, um, we waited for 55 minutes for um, Rise of the Resistance, and I inside kind of chuckled because I was like, I I can vividly remember waiting like three hours. From oh. Millennium Force. I was, that was, I was a story I told yeah. people. I was like, you know, I was agitated by way. We, you and I went Millennium mm. Force three hours. But you don't think yeah. anything because that is, to me. That's what you're there for. That's what you're there for. Also, like a lot yeah. of people still rate it the number one roller coaster in the world. There's higher and faster yeah. roller coasters, but what it does. In the park, right next to it. Yeah, right, exactly. And I've yeah, ridden higher and faster. Yeah, I've read. I've rode that, and I've rode other roller coasters that are higher and faster. But there's something about Millennium Force that yeah. just is different. And until you do it, yeah. and if you can do it, if you don't have you know certain fears and stuff like that, it is not that it's a Cedar Point ad, but that is still the greatest roller coaster I've been on. Yeah, it's well, and the thing about Cedar Point is like you go if you get there at ten o'clock and leave at eight, and you only ride six rides, but they're you know, Raptor, Millennium Force, Top Through Dragster, uh, Magnum, uh, then you're good. You're good. You know, yeah, it, you was, don't care. it was worth the trip. Yeah, 100%. Mantis, whatever. Yeah. So, you know, the, they just do roller coasters on a different level, but the production value that goes into everything at a Disney park. Right. When you're walking through, when you're in the lines and they bring you into like the different buildings yeah. and stuff like that, and you really get a feel for. You feel like you're, like you said, like you're part of whatever the presentation is, whether it's, you know, Star Wars, Haunted Mansion, um, it's small, you know, Big Indiana Thunder Jones. Mountain, it's any like, of yeah, Indiana Jones is like my downs, favorite yeah. to go through, honestly, right. like it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, you can get like the shows and, and the themed eating, uh, yeah. dining, the themed dining everywhere, everywhere you go. I mean, I've maintained like I'm, I'm a usually a, as we've documented, a pretty, pretty dour person. Uh, but when I'm in Orlando at Disney World, there's it's rare that I don't have a smile on my face. Yeah, just from and, and this is everything. this is my thing with Disneyland. You you don't leave anything other than happy. It's just what level of happy are yeah. you at the end of it? Right. I was stoked. Yeah. I yeah. made the, you know, I did the drive home in 12 parsecs. So, no. yeah, hey. I mean, I was cruising. Yeah, yeah, that was nice. Yeah, I get, you know, the the Magic Express on the way when you get off the airport or the airplane at the airport in Orlando and take the Magic Express into the resort is one of the happiest, like, rides of your life. And then <laughs> taking the Magic Express back to the airport to go home is one of the saddest rides. Right, know. right. Just because it's like, oh, I don't get to have fun every second of every day. And <laughs> I have to go back to the real world. 
Because like even the shitty parts of Disney are, of Disney World anywhere are good. Same Disneyland, even the crappy parts are like I still had a great time. Yeah, yeah. I could go on about Disney at, at length. We're planning on going the week between Christmas and New Year's. Like that's oh when nice we're going kids Christmas presents and, that's and everything. Fun. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Disney's sweet. But anyway, we move on. We do move on. Um, oh, so gaming news: When Microsoft purchased Bethesda parent company Zenimax, I like saying that. And all the studios that went with it, including Bethesda Game Studios, ID Software, Arcane Studios, Tango Gameworks, Machine Games, among others, many Sony PlayStation fans clamored for some type of counterpunch. Today may have been the beginning of that as one longtime collaborator joined the first party family, while another may not be far behind. House Marquee Games, famous for Super Stardust, Rezogun, and most recently PS5 exclusive Returnal, was purchased by Sony. The team brings a fast-paced arcade style of games to a first-party family in dire need of some diversity. Additionally, a Sony Japan Twitter account posted a tweet that has since been deleted that <clears throat> Blue Point Games, famous remake remaster studio behind the Nathan Drake's collection, The Last Guardian remaster, and most recently the remake of 2009's Demon Souls, was also joining the first party. Many have long speculated that both of these teams could join the first party due to their status as longtime PlayStation collaborators. So a couple things. Id, id software. And I'm sorry. just house mark, not house marky, but that's okay. Sorry. That's why I'm here. Yeah. I'm here for that. Uh, the other thing too is I don't know why they need the apostrophe S on Demon's Souls. Because the S in Souls is such a dominant sound. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, did, I had a very similar conversation one time with a friend of the program, Mike Kettle, about why does Victoria's secret, why is there a possessive apostrophe? It is her secret. I digress. Uh, yeah, this is kind of like, um, I think that these were very obvious gets for Sony. Uh, Housemark only makes games for PlayStation. Uh, they've made, going back to Super Stardust, which was 2007. So they've been working for, in a second party capacity with PlayStation for 14 years now. Resogun is one of the great early games of the PS4. It's super fast, fun, arcadey. It's, you can beat it in a sitting, but it's the score chasing, like old school kind of arcade style score, score chasing that brings you back to that game. Uh, it's fast paced. I really enjoy playing it. I haven't played Returnal yet. I'm kind of like, I've heard mixed reviews about it, but trusted people I trust like it. So I think I might give it a go maybe when it's on sale. The more interesting one here is Blue Point because as, a, as it says in the write-up, they make, they make remakes and they make remasters. And there's a boatload of games in the first party family that are stranded on old consoles that could use a fresh coat of paint in some capacity and brought forth like Resistance, Sly Cooper, uh, Jack and Daxter, and it would make more sense for an in in internal studio who specializes in making these games to go back and remake Sly yeah. than having Insomniac do it, or I'm sorry, Sucker Punch do it when they're working on the next Ghost of Tsushima. It would make more sense for a different team to make Jack and Daxter when clearly Naughty Dog has moved on past Jack and Daxter on to you know, Uncharted and the last of those things like that. Same thing with Insomniac. They're working on Spider-Man. They're working on New Ratchets. It doesn't make a ton of sense to devote resources to going back and meet, remaking or remastering the resistance games but those games are stranded on ps3 you can't even play them anywhere except for the ps3 so it makes sense to bring in a studio like this who has a heritage and has a specialization in in doing these type of games the nathan drake collection you know where they put the three uncharted games on one on one disc from ps3 to ps4 is great the last guardian and i actually have that wrong it's not the last guardian at all Shadow of the Colossus. Uh, but they remade Demon Souls, which was a FromSoft game from 2009. By all accounts, it's great on the PS5. It's a PS5 exclusive. So I think that these were two obvious gets. They're not on the same level as Bethesda. They're not on the same level as Insomniac. We talked at one point, Insomniac was purchased for uh, $240 million, I believe it was. Housemark wasn't bought for $240 million. Bluepoint wasn't. Bethesda or Microsoft paid billions, like $5 billion for Zenimax for all the Bethesda Jeez. game studios. So these aren't on that level, but I think that, that at the same time, Microsoft is a trillion plus dollar company and Sony's not. Yeah. So they have to be a little bit more calculating with their purchases. And I think that these are two, two teams that fit very nicely in the first party stable of, um, of studios. They're like the Tampa Bay Rays, you know, you, you work with what you have, you try to build something and you know, 
Sony, Sony's always contending. Don't you don't have to worry about Sony. By well, contending, they're winning. winning. Sony's, they're Sony's, winning. Yeah, Sony's they are the Tampa winning. Bay Rays. Yeah. They kind of win. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and and that's the thing is like even even with even with things not trending in the right direction for Sony right now and all the good press heading Microsoft's way, they're selling more PS5s than they sold in in the first you know however long than they did PS4s. Right, like that tells me that at the end of the day, you know, don't read your press clippings as, as my old high school basketball coach used to say, because <laughs> the only thing that matters at the end of the day is the final score. And right now, despite it all, Sony is Sony is winning. But I'm excited to see. I think that uh, Housemark will kind of stay in this, this AAA space. Uh, Returnal was certainly a AAA game. And then some of their other ones are, you know, on the A to A level kind of indie things, but they're very, very fun. And then I'm, I'm very interested to see where Blue Point goes. My hunch is that they're going to do some type of a remaster of Resistance, uh, which is an old Insomniac trilogy. But we shall see. And then that's, a, I would also say the Blue Point thing's not official, but I would expect that it's made official soon. Yeah. Soon, very soon. Number five, Britney's conservatorship, conservatorship follow up. After Britney, Britney gave a powerful and emotional plea about her conservatorship in Los Angeles last week. Many people came out in support of the pop icon. Her ex-husband, Kevin Federline, through his attorney, Mark Vincent Kaplan, said to People Magazine, quote, the best thing would be for their mom to be healthy and happy. And if either of those things aren't true, it doesn't provide for the best setting for custody to be exercised, end quote, says Kaplan, referring to his 43-year-old client's son's. Quote, Kevin certainly respects Brittany and only hopes hopes for the best for her because when the best for her is achieved, it's the best for their kids. The kids love their mother and he wants there to be a healthy and strong relationship, end quote. Christina Aguilera commented on the matter by saying through a tweet, quote, these past few days I've been thinking about Brittany and everything she is going through. It is unacceptable that any woman or human wanting to be in control of their own destiny might not be allowed to live life as they wish, end quote. She tweeted alongside a picture of the pair. Nothing has changed in regard to the legal status of her conservatorship in court, and her father has not commented. So I just brought this back because, like, you know, we we, we really hit this rate when it happened on the pod last week, and then everybody started commenting. I just really, I honestly brought up the two names I thought would be, like, the most important when you think about this is, you know, at the time Brittany came out, that was right when Christina Aguilera came out, and so they, you know, there was, I don't think it was ever really a rivalry or whatever. It was just two people making pop music. And then, of course, Kevin Federline, just, you know, everyone knows who that is. And, it, you know, I, I don't want to say I'm shocked, but, like, literally every single person that had any, like, they didn't, nobody was at, like, a lot of times people weren't even asked. They just said, this is sucks. What, you know, yeah. the, people weren't, at, you know, People Magazine asked Kevin Federline for comment, but a lot of people just literally just were tweeting things like, holy crap, I just heard the testimony. This is ridiculous. What are we doing here? And to have that kind of impact, I mean, I don't know, you know, obviously the impact of things won't change. Anything, but it doesn't make you wonder if like the court will try to speed up the process of like a next, you know, court appearance with her dad, who, you know, is just kind of in the weeds. Her mom came out saying she was like, you know, you know wondering what's going on. I don't understand why she's so far out of the picture. Um, Britney's sister, Jamie Lynn Spears, came out and was like, I adore her. And it's just, it's it's so weird to where this has gone. And it makes me super sad to read all these things and to see the videos of her. But to see these people come out and support her, I feel like if and when she gets past this, there are going to be so many people helping her that I don't think, I, I think she'll be able to come back and like have a normal life because I think everybody in the world wants to have her succeed. And I think that was the cool thing. That's why I put this in here is I think there's literally everyone, including her ex-husband, they're just like, all we want her to be is a normal person who's happy and healthy. Let's get her through this. Let's get her past this. Because right now, what she isn't having is a normal life with, you know, I know you caught up more on it. And it's really screwed up what she's going through right now. And that can't, what she's going through right now can't be any worse than what she was actually going through before all this. Yeah, I, I just real quick, can a conservative conservatorship be... Uh, reversed if there is showing of competency to manage the finances and, and personal affairs. I mean, how's that not obvious that she's capable of managing right. finances and, and personal affairs? I don't understand. I guess I would have to do a little bit more digging 
for my own volition to kind of see why this started to begin with. I know she was kind of off the rails there for a while, as we all kind of know, and you pointed out last week. But <clears throat> I don't think I think that there's been plenty of people who have been farther out in the left field than she was, even at her even at her worst. Yeah, that weren't placed into any kind of you know <laughs> indentured servitude. So uh, I, I guess. My next question is, is is what becomes the process to try to get her to, to be able to demonstrate this? You know, yeah. what is there like, is it like a psyche vow that she has to go through? Does she have to meet with, with like legal? That's kind of where I'm at in terms of like being interested in all this is, is basically the, the legal stuff. And obviously, like I said last week, the mental health things are, this is certainly a cautionary tale for, for some people. But now I'm, I'm, as I get more into it, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the legal process of how does she get this reversed? Right. Because clearly, I mean, she's only what, like 41, 40? She's 39, like I think. She's 39? I think she's okay, 39. So I thought she yeah. was, I thought she was more older. I thought she was older than, than that in terms of our collective ages. But yeah, it's just bonkers to me that I think she's clearly capable of managing her personal affairs and finances as a 39 year old woman. Yeah, and I also think it's like like you said, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It's like there's so many people out there just in normal everyday life that have no idea what they're doing with money. Just Right. You know, and so it's just like whatever her dad had like some sort of manipulative power over everything and obviously there's something going on there, almost like a cult mentality thing that maybe, you know, he was able to like do some psycho bat it, it, you can't you can't tell me for one second that she's less capable of managing her finances and, her per- and personal affairs than Kanye West. Right, right. You can't tell me that. It, it's like there was never a time. I mean, the the only real evidence we have of Britney kind of like going off the rails was shaving her head and then taking the umbrella to like the window of a car. Yeah. Kanye West, everyday life is just like worse than that. And so it's, and I'm not even saying like he needs to be under anything. I'm just pointing out no, the fact that like just as some, an example that he's the, out here walking around yeah he's out there walking around controlling his you know also she's you know she's rich she can just hire an actual person to handle her finances yeah. in not a way that it's like indentured servitude like you said like it's just you that's literally what happens when you become rich and famous you have people you have an accountant that handles your money you don't really even think about it. Like, he'll be like, hey, Brittany, I have this, you know, why don't you invest in this or do this and this? He won't even, like, say it. He'll just do it for her because she's, he's going to be like, this is what you're right. paying me well, to do. Well, you don't want, but that's the thing is I don't, I, I do feel like you don't want that to be your way of showing that you, well, I'll just have somebody take care of it. But I know that, I know that's not the way of saying, but it's like, I'm, yeah. my point is, before all this, the fact that he even got to here is insane to me in the, in the yeah. fact that, you know, what whatever her dad was able to do it i'm sure it was like he, he you know i i will just throw because he seems like i mean he always seemed weird before all this really if you were like a britney spears fan and like ever paid attention to him and i think i said it last week's episode i know i did and it's just like he was somehow able to like manipulate people and brainwash people into believing this kind of stuff at the time and so like and I, he probably brainwashed her into believing it there was probably some point at the time where he's like, oh, Brittany, you know, I need to take care of you. You know, we'll get you through this. And now we're 13 years down the road of this same right. bullshit. So, you know, I, I'm with you. I'm interested to see what the legal process is. And I hope, I, not to like, we need to make her life more public or whatever, but I do hope there's, we know, we actually are able to see somewhat of where this goes and why she's able to come out of it and what the actual process is, just for my own actual like mental state. I just want to know how someone comes out of something like this. I saw a hilarious tweet in regards to this. And it said, all y'all saying free Britney. What if she gets freed and then immediately drops a ska album? I'd be down. (laughs) Whatever Britney does, I'll support her. I've been with Britney since day one. I'll hang with her. Yeah. I I mean, you know, we'll we'll continue to keep an eye on this, but I'm just very curious about the legal, the legal process. Go listen to Blackout, man. That's her best album. Would you say that her and her dad's relationship is toxic? Nice. Nice. Well played. Well played. I like it a lot. Uh, We're going to move on to movie news. Uh, So much, much lighter note. Um, New Shang-Chi trailer 
uh, came out to this week with uh, some major surprises in it. Uh, this is a lot of fun. A lot of fun. This movie's going to be awesome, by the way. So did you see, you watched this? Yeah. Right? Yep, I watched and it right You saw before. who was in it at the end? Yeah. It's going to be... The Abomination? The Abomination, man. And Wong? And Wong. I didn't realize it was Wong until I, re- I, I watched the thing. After the yeah, thing. I watched the thing that kind of pointed that out. But yeah, Abomination, I was like, oh, this is cool. I don't remember anything that happened prior to that and that was at the end of the trailer yeah. but either way a lot of the 10 rings going around doing stuff but yeah yeah um you know the, yeah. this movie's gonna be they great the arm. yeah i can't wait september something yeah third fourth somewhere in there third i think memorial day yeah. weekend or labor yeah. day weekend i always get those yes. friggin holidays confused yeah. labor day week i'm sorry they're very similar yeah in many respects um despite not doing well in <laughs> in china what Fast Nine smashes China. pandemic era box office numbers. Fast Nine earns seventy million at the box off the domestic box office, surpassing the forty eight point five with Godzilla vs Kong. The film has made four hundred million dollars worldwide. It is the biggest domestic opening since Rise of Skywalker in two thousand nineteen. Yeah, this was just opening weekend, yeah. seventy million. So they, I, cool man, they could be on their way to uh, a, a decent payday considering everything that's going on. Didn't do so hot in China. <laughs> But you know, whatever. Yeah, that's, that's probably because of John John Cena. Right. That that probably hurt yeah. things. Um yeah. Samuel L. Jackson will receive a motherfucking honorary Oscar for contributions to film. I mean There were some other people announcing this, but And whatever. He you know, he should just it shouldn't even be like this thing where it's like an honorary one. They should just like just give him one and not even say what it's about. <laughs> they're like and they, they just randomly somebody comes out there has and he just, ever been nominated for I'm sure he, he's had to be nominated Pulp like Fiction, Pulp Fiction you know, I, think, I would think yeah best supporting he was definitely nominated but best there supporting. should just like have someone come out there it's like Dave Chappelle comes out and he's just like and the Oscar goes to Samuel L. <laughs> Jackson and they're like we have no context but nobody would care they were like, yeah, the Oscar yeah. does go to Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> You're motherfucking right it does. <laughs> motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane. Uh, <laughs> Scarlett Johansson to produce and star in a Tower of Terror film. Boy, she doesn't have anything going on now that, that Natasha Romanoff is dead. It is weird. She's just like, all right. She's still tied into that Disney. Mm-hmm. That's what we'll do. Mm-hmm. She's probably signed like a, a thing we don't even know about. Which is I'm cool. interested. I'll be interested to see if this is a Twilight Zone thing because the original, like the Tower of Terror, if you go to Disney World, I think they might have read. It's Guardians of Galaxy. It in, it's Guardians yeah, of Galaxy. I know they redid it in, in, in California. Yeah. It's Guardians. I don't know if it's, I'll have to do some recon to see if it's still um, Twilight Zone, Tower of Terror in, uh, in Orlando or if they made the move there to guardians as well but yeah originally tower of terror is a is a twilight zone yeah thing. right so i'd be interested to see if that's the you know uh thing. dune delayed three weeks from october 1st to october 22nd they just want to give people more time to read that giant ass book i think is i don't well i don't understand yeah this was a weird one for me is there something else coming out at that time and they don't want to like cannibalize their own yeah not that i can think of yeah, I don't know. Unless they want more distance from Shang Chi, which I mean, it's a that's already a month. I mean, you're not gonna. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe it's just maybe some people coming up in this next movie are actually in Dune, and they had to like you know I'm sure scheduling conflict. Uh, Knives Out Two begins filming in Greece. No word on if a town was built to account for the cast, which contains eight thousand nine hundred forty three members. Yeah, I am concerned about the hotel capacity in Greece right yeah. now. Uh, yeah, how do you social distance with a cast that thing? <laughs> I mean, Greece doesn't care. They just, like, Greece right. is so laissez-faire about everything in this world. They're just like, we'll fit you in. Just swim in the ocean in between I, scenes. Yeah. yeah or the ocean, the sea. Whatever. I'm sorry. I Now that we're doing this and we announce, like, Knives Out 2 begins filming, I'm going to be, like, way more cognizant of begins filming, ends filming when it actually comes out. Oh, sure. Where before, I don't, I've never even thought about that. Right. It, it would just be like, damn, they, uh, James Cameron's been working on Avatar 2 for, you know. Whatever. A decade. Yeah. 66 years. Feels that way. <laughs> Ron Perlman of Hellboy and Sons of Anarchy fame joins the cast of Transformers Rise of the Beast as Optimus Primal. Leader of the Maximalzo. All right. No, just Maximals. Oh, okay. Uh, Sorry. They're not Spanish. I didn't know. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> 
I, you are I, Ron Burgundy. I, I am. I am Ron Burgundy. Go fuck yourself, San yeah. Diego. <laughs> Ron Perlman is, um, he's got a big jaw. It, uh, it could have just been Transformers Rise of the Beast, and I'd be like, he just plays a beast. And you would be, I, yeah. So. I don't care to see this. No. The lead in it is um, Anthony Ramos. Okay. From Hamilton. Yeah, and. Uh, and in the Heights. Heights. Yeah. He also had an album come out this week. Um, I didn't listen to yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't seem like the guy who's leading an action movie. I mean, great singer. Yeah, great, good you know, personality, no but yeah, it doesn't have yeah. like that. Uh, Why would he stoop to this? Money. I mean, I'm sure it pays well. Yeah, money. There, there uh, John Wick. Because Jack- even though these things are terrible. But people don't care these about that. Are, they're terrible. Mark Wahlberg just see them. Keep, kept doing stuff like this. He doesn't care. You know, yeah. it fills the pocketbooks, man. Yeah. John Wick Chapter 4 officially begins filming. Sweet. I'm stoked. These movies are great. They're all good. And this will be good, too. I have no doubt in my mind this will be good. Uh, I know you haven't watched them, but they're great. I'll watch them. I'll, I'll you tell should. You I mean, like, I know you don't like recommendations and whatever, on my, but they're fun. They are so much fun. Uh, fans lost their minds over an ending quirk changed, changed into the end credit sequence of WandaVision. What appears to be a Doctor Strange cameo... In the form of a strange blob cascading across some added stuff in trees was, in fact, the studio editing out a duck that flew through the shot. Fans took the internet to theorize that it was the Sorcerer Supreme making a visit to Wanda at her cabin, but alas, merely fanboys fanboying. I went back and watched it. Yeah. And the thing is, is that this, like, weird green screen blob thing, it's like, yay, on the screen, it's like, yay, size. Is in the shape of Doctor Strange in Infinity War when he like comes down. That's so cape. funny. It's like it looks the exact same. That's why everybody's losing their freaking. I, minds I wonder if it. they did it intentionally just to make people lose their mind. Probably. Well, then the other weird thing too was that they put in there was that 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 wasn't in there before, and I don't know who has time to like look for this shit. Right. When the show ended four months ago or whatever, three months ago, not in the credits. Right. But now in the credits. Is the Doctor Strange theme song or whatever the composer from Doctor Strange? It's crazy. I don't know. I don't know. People, it was a duck. Yeah, it was a duck. I wish we just saw the duck. Some would say, some would say it was foul play. Ooh, you're on it tonight, friend. (laughs) (laughs) You're on it tonight. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we have a food review. Uh, 4th of July weekend is headed headed to uh, the Americans. Yeah. I'm sorry for our English listeners. Uh, we don't have anything prepared for like Boxing Day or, you know, whatever English holidays you guys have going on over there. But we will. We will. We'll do some research. On, we'll figure uh, it out. You know, something traditional. We'll eat some beans and toast or something. Have a full English breakfast and have massive <laughs> diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably what they think of fourth of july uh fourth of july uh, you know we record at night obviously we record after you're done working and the difference in the time zones is such that i'm not going to make a fourth of july barbecue at 11 o'clock at night but what we did do was we we did a take on s'mores we did so we didn't want to do just regular s'mores we wanted to do something do something a little bit different do something deconstruct the s'more and then reconstruct it into something like else. Hugh Atchison here for all you food people. Right. So what we did here was we did the indoor s'more, which is a bit of a bake. It is. Okay. It's got uh, golden graham cereal. And then you make heat in a pot, marshmallows, sugar, butter, chocolate chips, a little bit of vanilla, melt it all up, put it on, mix it in with the golden graham. So then what it also calls for is to mix in the remaining uh, marshmallows, but I just decided to top mine with the marshmallows as well as uh, the remaining chocolate chips. So I'm going to bring it in here. I'm going to bring it in. Show you all what we're dealing with here. So there it is. Got the uh, 4th of July napkin also. I like obviously. that. I like that. So that's what we're looking at. America. Okay. I actually hate I actually hate it when people say that. Mark, I do too. Actually, mine I'll just bring it up. I did I just did my own recipe. So okay. I kind of just took the elements. I had graham crackers. Oh, sweet yours really look like sweet potatoes. Yeah, I guess it kind of does. I got the marshmallows. I got uh, graham crackers. I got some uh, 
gingerbread magic spoon going in there just because that's what I had lying around. Felt like it gave me the essence of it. Threw some chocolate chips. I just mixed it all up. A little butter. A little, uh, I put a little salt in there just, a little, just to give it a little pizzazz, a little fanciness. Put it in the oven. 350 for 15 minutes. It looks good. I all mean, right. I'm excited. Let's dig yeah. in. All right, so I'm going to go... You want to go? I'm, I'm, mine's like falling apart a little bit, so I'm just going to go ahead. I can't. I'm going to put like some milk on yeah. this tomorrow morning. And have you know how we do this. There there are no rules here. It's so just I'm right. It's food. Outback Steakhouse, the way we do things here. I'm... I'm. Oh, this is a real gonna chocolatey take as many, bite. going to take as many bites as I damn well please. Yeah. So... Here, here we go. Here, here it is. Okay. Um, oh, big bite there. A lot of crunch in that bite. I have so much crunch. Not a lot of the sauce. I'm gonna try and get another one here with some of the chocolate on it. Yeah. I'm glad to put salt in there. I think it brought everything out. That was really good. It tastes like a s'more. Mm. It tastes just like a s'more. As it should. It has all the elements of a s'more. It could just be the bite <clears throat> or the, the piece that I cut off. But mine could have benefited from a little bit more um, marshmallow flavor. And I almost wonder if... I almost wonder if marshmallow fluff... Ooh. Like you can get like marshmallow fluff, you know what I'm talking about? Would have been a better option than the melt, melting the marshmallows. I used Because mine's very chocolatey. It's very chocolatey. It's not a lot of marshmallow to it. I um, I couldn't find small marshmallows because I went to Trader Joe's side the big marshmallows, and I mm -hmm. just broke up like a bunch of those and put them all over the place. It's pretty. Mine is pretty marshmallowy. It is still primarily right. chocolate. Um, yeah. But that's kind of when you have a s'more. It is primarily chocolate. You're kind of almost getting more of the char when you have a s'more. How do you like your marshmallows on a s'more, Brian? I like mine looking like um. Thanos after he gets torched. That's how I like mine. No. I like mine dark. No, I like... No, no, um... No, I don't like any burn. No, see, I, I'm a big <clears throat> burn guy. Just golden. All right, you're a traditionalist. You know, very golden, yeah. That's yeah. how mine cooked in the oven. Just mm. like a nice... I'm... Yeah. I, I, this is kind of too how, addictive. How do you feel about the square marshmallows that they make? Like, that are perfectly Is fit for that? That's neat. Yeah. That's a lazy man's way out. Yeah, that's a lazy. Mine man. was real. Mine was real goopy. It, it looks like somebody wiped their ass with mine. <laughs> Yours does. I mean, mine's gonna look like that when I finish. I can't. I, the, the only. I mean, there is super sweet. I'm gonna have diabetes after that. But um, the only thing. The other thing too is I left mine out. Yeah, I put mine out like whenever we started recording. Like right yeah, we started. And I think it might have benefited from just staying in the fridge. Might have held everything together a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I baked mine. We're talking, mine came out of the oven about two hours ago, and I just let it sit out. So it didn't have, a, you know, okay. there wasn't a ton of time, period. It's, you know, I guess the one thing I will say is there is something about, like, having an actual s'more with, like, right. not everything. Like, you get everything in all in one bite, but not, it sounds weird. You get everything in one bite, but not everything in one bite. So, like, everything's not mixed together. It's yeah the layers, which is what makes right. a s'more a s'more. Yeah. This is a fine okay, thing. Yeah. Like what I kind of like I said, I may make a small bowl of this tomorrow for my cereal, and I'll be all right with that. Yeah, very small bowl. It is very sweet. I am gonna have cardiac arrest. I think I am. I am. Yeah, flying high and loose. I don't know if the added sugar was necessary too. I didn't add like sugar to like mine because I was like, this is super like sweet. Half cup. I I took mine from a Betty Crocker online thing. Because we said, let's do s'mores. Yeah. All right, what do you want to do? Do you want to put different candy on them? We thought about doing, I, like, the cookies and cream Hershey's. And then I came across that recipe. So I think what I might do is a s'more with a Reese's cup. I love Reese's cups. Well, did you see the the um, the other uh, thing I sent you? The other link I sent you? No, I don't think I did. When I, when I, I sent you. It. I sent you two. Yeah, I sent you two links. I think I just saw the one. One was for the indoor s'mores. And then the second one had... One of them was a hurt, like oh, it nice. had like fifteen ways to change up your s'more, and one of them was a Reese cup. That would be good. So they look like they all look like super French to me. Yeah, and I'm not a big fan of French cooking. Oh, oh the French. French friend the of the French program, Orson Welles. Do... <laughs> the French do 
Like their portion sizes are meant for like babies. I'm a huge well, person. I they also food. eat a ton of things. They're like their portion sizes are meant for babies because they eat like 55 courses throughout the day. Okay, so do I. It's just that my portions are man sized. There's a reason I'm this big. <laughs> Fair enough. It's because I eat a lot of Fair things enough. that are bad for me, too. But there you go. Okay, so... That was fun. Uh, on a 10, on a scale of 1 out of 10, the, your version of the Indoor S'more is slightly different than mine, obviously. Uh, I would give mine a, a 6.5. It's just so sweet. I need yeah. I need something to counter it. Maybe the next time, I'll if I do this again, I'm going to put like dark chocolate in it to just mm -hmm. balance it out. Yeah, I'm going to say a six for mine, and I think that the difference for me was that I should have just left it in the fridge. I think it would have held together a little bit better. Sure. And it also didn't have enough marshmallow flavor for me, and I really think that the marshmallow, uh, like the fluff that you get, yeah. would have made a difference. But that's, uh, that's a food review. Food review. Boom. Boom. Ugh. Coming down hard off of this. Quick hitters. Why don't you go ahead? Disney has, oh god, in a new Lego set, changed the name of Boba Fett's iconic ship from Slave 1 to Boba Fett's Starship. That's creative. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Oh no. I'm going to tell you why. Fuck you, Disney. Because, oh, it's negative connotation. Sla slaves is a negative connotation and one of our most popular characters who is a bad guy mind you for 40 years until the mandalorian just decided to make him a good guy basically which he's still really a bad guy right he's just being a helpful one at right. that, an anti-hero how many people do you think outside of people who are actually star wars fans knew what the name of Boba Fett's ship is. It's not the Millennium Falcon. Right. Right. You know what I mean? And I th this is one of those things where it was like, it's to me, it's like the little Nas X shoes, or the, I'm sorry, the little Nas X shoes <laughs> with Nike, where it's don't make it a story when you don't need to make it a story. Right. Nobody gave a shit that the name of that ship was Slave, Slave One. No one. I don't know. Maybe they don't want us to connect the dots with their seedy dealings with China, who actually uses slaves in internment camps. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just theorizing here. Right, right. It's just ridiculous. It's just leave it. Like, well, what's the next thing? They're going to change the name of the Death Star because they don't want the negative connotations of fucking death. I hate this. Oh, I, I hate, hate it too. Most of the things that Disney has done with Star Wars. Most of them. There's a few good ones, obviously. You know, we Mandalorian, notwithstanding. We we did our Star Wars rankings. We both like Rogue One. We both like Solo. We both didn't hate The Force Awakens. But other than that, and they took um, they took the Iron Bikini off the the market. You know, yeah, like five years ago. Oh, the, the, and it's just like it's I a, don't. It's too. It gets to the point where it's too much. And for me, this is too much. And maybe this is a weird hill to die on. Maybe this is a weird stand to take. But for me, this is this is just too. This is a bridge too far. For me, it's the wussification of America. It's the wussification yeah. of America, man. Everybody gets a trophy, and we got to rename ships. It's, that aren't even real. This isn't like it's tearing not real. down a statue of Robert E. Lee. It's a fucking made up thing. Yes. It's so that stupid. mostly no one knew about. Yeah. They made it. They made it more of a thing that they talked about it and if they just let it be. Yeah. Uh, they interviewed uh, They interviewed the guy at Lego and he said, uh, I don't remember if it's like the liaison to Disney or if it was like a higher up or whatever. And he said, yeah, this came from Disney. Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> 100%. He immediately threw them under the bus. But here's the, here's the rub with this, right? Uh, there's three new Mandalorian Lego sets coming out in August. One of them is uh, Moff Gideon's light cruiser. One of them is the tank, the grief, the grief uh, action Jackson, Carl Weathers drives in episode four of season two yeah. is the tank thing. And the other one is a small version of Slave One, which I will continue to call it because that's the name that's of the it. Name of shit. It's, a, it's like a 536 or so piece set. 
I have the big one. It's one of my favorite sets that I've ever put together. And it's sitting on my shelf. And you know what the name of it is? What Slave is it? one. Save one. Fool's gold. <laughs> Fool's gold. I thought you were going to say something like, oh, I changed it to something else really funny. That's what I was waiting for. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's Slave One. That's the name of the ship. Don't at me, Disney. Actually do at actual... us, Disney. Yeah, that's true. Please Maybe we should start a, like I mean, all we need to do is start a controversy. Yep. So add us, Disney. Yeah. Slave one, baby. Yeah, it's it's it, it, here's well, here's the real sad <laughs> part about it is, and the reality of it is, is that you know, if I really cared deeply about this, I would take a stand and I would stop watching like Disney related Star Wars products. But then we wouldn't have a show, right? So take my money, Disney. But take, go fuck yourself. Like <laughs> take my money, but go fuck yourself. Yep. Fool's gold has actual flecks of gold in it. Who's the fool now? Still everyone buying it. Flecks of gold are... That's, yeah. That's a still a fun thing. I mean... Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah, that was one of those, uh, you know, fun with science things. Uh, media recommendations. Uh, so I finished Portrait of a Mirror. Like I said, I just want to shout out again because that book is amazing. Um, yeah, just go ahead and read it. It's really good. Nobody will probably, like, it's one of those books where I read it and I'm like, this should win awards and nobody will read it or whatever, even though it's very good in books that everyone wins awards and everybody talks about. Blah. I've read those books and they're always annoying to me. Biggest one to me is, uh, Lincoln and the Bardo. That book sucks. I don't know why anyone thinks it's good. Um, Rhett watched My Idiot Brother, um, Paul Rudd movie. A lot of other, like, good people in it. Zoe Deschanel's in it. Um, yeah, it's really just, just one of those kind of movies. It's, like, funny, heartwarming. Yeah, it's just a fun movie to get through. And I will say my biggest thing, though, is last week, Conan O'Brien, um, stopped doing a late night show. Uh, anyone who knows me knows I love Conan O'Brien. Uh, Janie got me a signed Simpson script when, that, from him, um, He's actually coming to the bookstore I work at, and I haven't done anything weird, and I don't, like, do that kind of thing where I, like, come up to people and be, like, super weird about it. But, no, I, like, love Conan, so I would, I've would just been watching Conan O'Brien clips. Um, so if, you, yeah. you know, just go and watch Ginger No. It's from, like, 92 or 93. It's a dog with a gun. It's hilarious. Um, Kermit the Frog gets involved. But there's so many good ones. N- old ones, new ones. Conan's always been funny to me. If, um... If you want to watch uh, David Letterman defend Conan O'Brien, where Jay Leno is taking over, that's really fun, too. It's called, like, uh, Conan's Not at Fault, I think is the thing. Conan isn't to blame David Letterman. That must have been trending, because when I was on YouTube earlier, it popped up as one of my suggestions. Okay. It's, yeah, because it's super funny. It's just, there's probably three big comedic influences in my life. Jerry Seinfeld, Conan O'Brien, and... Eddie Murphy, it was probably, like, my third, you know, if I were really throwing it in, like, later on with John Mulaney and stuff, but, um, Conan's just so far up there, and the clips are, every, if you just search clips, you're not gonna be disappointed. I watched him help his assistant buy a car today, and it's amazing. So, watch Conan O'Brien clips, because you're gonna have a great time. He's super funny, and, um, yeah, you're not gonna have any problems with it. You're gonna be better off. Mm. What about you, Bren? I finished, uh, that show... That I talked about Ragnarok. last week, Ragnarok on Netflix. Yeah, I watched season two in a day, in less than twenty four hours. So <laughs> nice. You could say I was into it. So yeah. again, thanks to David S for Carn City for recommending me that. I am trying to take more recommendations. Far Cry Four uh, is the game that I've just been <clears throat> kind of playing. I do have a question for you with regards to to that yeah with 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 far cry 4 where where do you stand on violence against video game doggos they're not real right so, so um whatever it, it's like whatever to me because i saw it, one in the face with a shotgun yeah, well my thing would be like this it's like anybody is like okay it's like blaming a kid that played resident evil and he went out and killed people that kid was gonna do something yeah. anyhow Right, like I could play that game. You could, you put that. You should. You're not going to go. You might shoot your own doggo in the face that you don't like. No, <laughs> I would never do that. I'd never do that. Never do that. <laughs> um, but um, no, I just, like that's the thing. It's like that's not going to make any like person that wasn't going to do that in the beginning to do it. It's a video game. Right. Yeah. It's like anything. Guess what? Like. 
I'm not going to score 63 points in a basketball game just because I played NBA, you know, 2K right. and did it. So right. I wish I could. Not going to happen. Right. <clears throat> um, yeah. that, that's the way I look at it. You can't, bla- you can't do one thing, say like, well, this guy killed people because he played a certain violent video game. And it's like, well, I've been playing right. NBA 2K forever. I'm not in the NBA. Can't right. associate. You literally can't do that. So, yeah, I'm right. fine with that. You know, just. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, because I was, you know, taking over an enemy base in a rock. Well, you got to do what you got to do in a video game. Yeah. Yeah. So he took he took two. He took two to the chest <laughs> Jeez. from a heavy machine gun. <laughs> do what you got to do, like you said. There was a lot of, there was a lot, there was like public outcry uh, over The Last of Us Part Two and how like one of the things was you had to kill like dogs in the game to sure. advance, basically. I'm playing a game that came out in 2014, so six years prior to The Last of Us, and I'm just murdering these these animals. everything <laughs> yeah, everything it's just, it's just like a dog comes at me you know well cute little dog out and then bah, bah, bah. <laughs> hey i needed his hide to sure. make a new new ammo pouch it's true uh, yeah like you said i mean that's a that's probably a whole extra episode one time but you know i don't i don't buy it anyway uh, we want to thank John for coming on uh, for the summer of George. The great episode. Great episode. Great episode. Uh, it was a lot of fun talking to him. Uh, we have some uh, we have some tricks up our sleeves uh, coming up here in the next month or so. Marvel Part Two. Uh, we may do an extra. We might. We've kicked around the idea of doing a, a very sports centered extra episode we may do it we may not we'll see we don't i don't know if we'll have any time you know right right it's home depot, it's home depot. Bath, bad bath and beyond i don't know i don't know if we'll have time so uh, those things and you know we're getting close we're getting ever so close here in the next couple months to the bxg's first birthday so that'll be exciting so, what do you get someone for their first anniversary paper paper yeah paper paper boy paper boy i don't know what what do you first anniversary you get like a yeah paper I think. oh god i don't know you get a certificate i don't know a certificate of a uh, trophy a trophy for winning yeah. the championship that doesn't exist everybody everybody, everybody gets, gets one a trophy. jesus uh bxg podcast publishes every friday well oh, excuse me friday at 12 p.m eastern standard time 9 a.m pacific time 7 a.m. Hawaiian time. <laughs> Aloha. That's not a Hawaiian time. That sounds that sounded weird. Social media at BHG. Uh, on <laughs> I thought about mixing at, it up. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. At BHG uh, podcast on uh, Instagram at GT fills at Y2B, Facebook.com slash BHG podcast, Twitter at BHG podcast, YouTube BHG podcast videos. Last week was the first week that all six six pack segments made it onto the YouTube channel. Got a lot of got a lot of feedback on that. A lot of people liked it. A lot of, a lot of oh, you psychos over there, nice psychopath, watching a static image of us talking in the background. I like it. Episodes. It's weird to me. I don't understand it, and I never will. I respect uh, it. Ah, sure. With that being said, uh, again, the the, um, the giveaway, 25 people share a post. Uh, make sure you tag us because sometimes if you do the Instagram share and you just share it, it doesn't necessarily pop up that, that you shared it. So make sure you, you throw one of us on there to, to let us know that you're tagging us. Uh, otherwise, uh, tell your friends, tell your family. Tell your mothers. To have a happy and safe 4th of July, try yourself some s'mores. I have some bomb pops or rocket pops or whatever they call it in your region of the country. In the unmistakable essence of the BXG podcast. Take care, friends. Thanks for listening.